Hi, welcome to the Sigma Path. In this episode, I'm going to show you something really quite interesting, uh, which are these watt meter units, and we'll talk about them in detail. I'm also going to let you know who's the winner of the oscilloscope giveaway, which was, I think, in the previous video or the video before that. And there's going to be even more giveaways. So watch until the end of the video, and then we're going to discuss this. So why do I want to talk about these things? Well, think about the following scenario. Imagine it's the 1950s, and somebody gives you the problem of building an instrument that can measure how many watts is being dissipated into a load but you have no solid state devices and you're not allowed to use any tube amplifiers you have to do this completely passively and to make matters even more complicated you want the units to be able to measure dc power and ac power so it has to work with dc or ac signals now obviously for measuring power you're going to need to measure current and voltage but how do you create something with an analog display like this that shows you the equivalent power being dissipated into the load by simply putting those two uh, voltage and currents into the unit. And remember, no active devices. So think about that. That's actually quite ingenious how this is accomplished. And it's a really old technology used in more than just these type of devices. So let's take a close look at one of these units. Uh, so on the left side is where you put the current in. So there's two terminals here, these metallic ones, and you just simply put the current into one and out of the other, like you would with an any uh, ammeter, for instance. At the top here, you have two terminals. One is labeled 300 volts, and the other one is labeled 150 volts. Clearly, for the two ranges of the voltages, you can uh, enter into this. Now, remember, this has no auto ranging. So if your voltage is more than 150 volts, you're going to have to go on the 300 volt terminal. And that's how you accomplish the two different ranges. And on the other side, we have the ground for the voltage, and we also have a knob over here which can select between high and low for the current range. So this thing basically has two current ranges and two voltage ranges, and this is a mechanical uh, switch, very hefty and uh, quite difficult to turn actually, and you can see why once we open it. Now, I'm not going to open these ones, I actually bought a third one because I like these so much and I didn't want to open them and destroy them to disassemble this to a point where I can show you the inter internal construction. It's a fairly destructive disassembly. So I just bought one that was completely broken and uh, to just so you can see what's going on on the inside. Now what makes this, this particular one really interesting is that it has a calibration sticker. And check it out, it's been calibrated in 2013. That's crazy for something so old to be calibrated. I mean, an instrument like this is essentially obsolete, but it's just so cool to have one. And who's calibrated it? Norton Grumman. So this has been most likely part of some kind of a government project, some kind of a legacy instrumentation of some kind who knows what they were doing with it but pretty amazing to see something like this so they have calibrated at 400 hertz from 350 watts to 1500 watts uh, cal from, sorry from dc to 400 hertz so they've really cal the hell out of it and by to plus or minus 0.5 percent that's pretty amazing so now i hope you had a chance to think about how you would design something like this so let's take a step back and figure out first of all we know how to calculate power. We just multiply voltage by current. But how can we multiply voltage by current in a way to give us a mechanical movement that is corresponding to power? Well, if you know anything about AC motors, AC motors kind of already do that because you're putting a voltage across an AC motor that creates two different magnetic fields at the same time with the appropriate phase shift between them depending on how it is done mechanically or so and that's how the motor constantly turns around so what you're doing is you are interacting two different magnetic fields which you are generating yourself now this does exactly the same thing you can create a magnetic field because you have current flowing through this terminal so that can create one magnetic field and then you can create another magnetic field by applying a voltage and that magnetic field can interact with the one generated by the current terminals and that interaction can then move the needle but you can imagine that mechanically to design something like this is pretty difficult because this is a free moving needle which means that it's going to have to be on a spring loaded torque mechanism that holds it all the way to the left and as you apply more torque it can overcome the spring and go higher and higher that's how a regular multimeter with these analog displays works that's exactly how it is except that for an analog one the needle is sitting inside a permanent magnet and in this one the needle is sitting inside a magnet you create from the current port and that's genius because the stronger the current is the more force you will have on the needle for the same voltage and the strong and for a constant current the stronger the voltage you apply there is more magnetic field 
applied against the magnetic field generated from the current port and that's going to move the needle. So it's really quite clever and simple at the same time. Instead of using a permanent magnet, which is traditionally used for, let's say, voltmeters or ammeters, they're creating the magnet through applying a current through another coil. So it's kind of like a DC motor, and it's also very similar to how a lot of the energy consumption measurement meters for your house work before all these new electronics ones came, the ones with the rotating disc, that's exactly how they do it. And they do it in a similar fashion. There's actually a motor in there and there's some phase shift happening because of the, uh, the metal that they put in there. That's a really cool mechanism too. But this one is cool because, well, we want to measure watts in the lab and that's exactly how we're going to do it. So let's take a look at the traditional milliamp meter that you've probably seen. This is also a pretty old instrument with a really nice large display. And this can measure several ranges in milliamps. And there's a knob over here which I have removed so we can disassemble it. And you simply put current in here. So once you put current in there, you have a couple of different ranges. And what this instrument does is that it puts a series resistor uh, in, in series with your input. And depending on the value of that resistor, you're going to be able to put a different voltage across the coil that is inside this little housing here. And that's what's going to move the needle. So that's how they select the ranges. It's really not that unusual. So if you look over here, the two wires sit between the first and the last points of these resistors, which are just a bunch of wires that they have wound together. And this rotary switch simply selects uh, where these inputs appear. Uh, and depending on the, the range, you simply put a different resistor in the circuit. So let's go ahead and remove the front panel so we can take a close look at the actual coil construction so we can see how the needle moves around. So let's go ahead and take a close look at this. Let me zoom in as much as this allows before it goes out of focus. I think it's probably somewhere around here. There it is. So look, take a look very carefully uh, at this construction. So there is a silver piece at the very bottom. That's our magnet. And there's a ring around it which creates a nice insulated region. That insulation is really important because you don't want any magnetic field interfering with whatever is going on in there. Uh, because otherwise you're going to simply read gibberish. We're relying on interactions of two magnetic fields here, and those fluxes cannot leave the unit, and no flux should be able to enter the unit. So having said that, if the needle moves, you can see how the mechanism moves around. So we have one of the wires of the coil connected to here, which goes underneath, and it ends right here in this pin. And that's connected to a spring underneath it, which is wound in a nice tight fashion right underneath this screw. You cannot see it. But if I move the needle, you can see how the coil moves around. So it's kind of like a DC motor, essentially, a DC motor that you never change the polarity. So the more current you put, stronger the magnetic field, and it's going to overcome that spring torque that's already there. I'm going to counterbalance weight on the other side so that when it's sitting upright, you've got the right movement, the right balance, and everything. This is a delicate mechanical design. Now, this structure of this spring that can move a needle is similar to how analog clocks used to work also. If you ever open an analog clock and you see a wheel that's bouncing back and forth on a spring, that's how they manage to get the exact timing. So depending on how much energy you put into that wheel, depending on how much torque there was, how much inertia there was, that's how they were getting the one second ticks coming from the old clocks. So this technology shows up in a lot of different places. It's Like I said, it's like a DC motor. And if I ever move the needle myself like this, and if I were to measure the voltage across the two terminals, I would actually see a voltage because it would act like a generator, which would be the opposite of a DC motor. So the technology, once you understand it, is not very complicated, but the mechanical design is. So now let's go to the watt meter and see how the design of that differs from the design of this, because this has a fixed permanent magnet. But now what we want to do is create our own magnetic field using the current and then use the voltage to move the needle, which makes it quite a bit more interesting and more complicated. Let's go take a look at it. And here's this beautiful mechanical piece, which is at the heart of these watt meters. So let's examine it and see how it works. Now, as I said earlier, this is going to have to have two coils in it that they're going to interact. Now, we can already see the outer coils here. So if you look over there, there's one wire here and one wire here. This is where the current enters the system. So you put the current through these wires, and it's going to go around these loops. But there's also the rotary switch selector out here, which selects the low or the high mode for the current. And that simply selects how many turns you're engaging from these coils. There's one also on the other side. So depending on how many of these turns you're engaging, you're going to get a different magnetic field, of course. And the advantage is that for the same current, you can have twice the strength of the magnetic field if you use twice as many turns. And this is normal electromagnetic relationships. So having said that, it means that we can select this. But once we select these, these two coils are going to create 
a magnetic field. So where is the other coil? Well, the other coil is sitting on the inside, and it can freely rotate. I can rotate this on the inside of these two coils, which is just absolutely beautiful. So I've taken this apart here, so we can pull this up away. Sorry, I'm looking at this in an awkward angle. So if I open it, you can see very clearly how it is constructed on the inside. So this is actually a coil with many, many turns. It's just so fine that you can't really see the, ter the turns there. Remember, this is the voltage coil, so it doesn't need to have a very thick wires. This is the current. That's why it has very thick wires. This is rated for uh, several amps up to about uh, seven and a half. So I believe they put them in parallel or they just simply disengage them, or they put them in series, probably in series versus in parallel for the current handling capability. I have to route the wires, but that's most likely what's going on there. So this is very thin because it's supposed to handle a lot of voltage. There's actually a very large resistor, which is also in series with it, which I will show you in just a second. So here are the springs I was talking about. Look at them. They're so fine and they're so small. These, resist these uh, springs is what loads the coil. You can see that you can calibrate it by moving this left and right. But the voltage is entered through one terminal of the coil, which is here, and the other terminal, which is up there. So these coils actually carry the same current that ultimately enters this coil over here. And there's two really fine wires that enter this coil from this. They run along this wall, and they rotate many, many, many times, and they go back up and then eventually reach these uh, coils to exit as well. So this is not centered anymore. That's why it moves around. Once it's centered, it, it is finely balanced between the top and the bottom. So the stronger current that you put into this coil, which is a function of the voltage, it's going to interact with the magnetic field generated by this coil, and that's how it will turn. And this spring here preloads it so that uh, it has some torque initially. So if I were to rotate this by hand, you can see it's, of course, moving all over the place right now, but you get an idea of how it works. And this is why I needed to buy another one to take apart to show you, because you can imagine that once you do this, you cannot put this back together. This is all hand-assembled and is just lovely. I mean, people who used to make watches basically were doing the same thing. There's in the old days where everything was hand-assembled there. So I, I really like these mechanical devices. Now, there's even more detail here. For example, there's a rudder here that is sitting in this cavity, and this is covered at the top, so there's air trapped in this cavity. So when this moves back and forth, if it needs to move very fast, the movement is going to be dampened by the movement of this rudder through this air, because air has some you know, finite viscosity to it. So therefore, it can't vibrate. I believe this is what this is for, but it's just amazing. And there is one on this side as well, I think, if I just haven't taken that side apart. I also forgot to mention that this entire structure is sandwiched between these two shields, so this prevents any magnetic field from entering and exiting. So you can re see the resemblance of the design of this shield to how transformers are made. It's made of many, many insulated layers next to each other, very common way of handling and absorbing and containing magnetic fields inside a cavity like this. So this simply sits I, how was it designed? I think it was just sitting like this all around it. So really complicated, lovely hand design. So now what about the resistor? Well, this entire thing sits in this cavity over here. This is the cavity. These are the voltages that come in from uh, these terminals over here. Let me zoom in a little bit out here. So these two go into these gigantic resistors. You can see all these hand-woven metal resistors, wire resistors, uh, that have uh, probably the resistance that was written as part of it is in here. And depending on which one of these two you engage, you're going to go through a different number of these, and you're going to get a different resistance, a factor of two difference. And then those two simply come over here, and then in engage into the coils that you saw, and that's how the needle eventually moves. And that's why there are holes at the top here to dissipate the power, because if you let this run, you're going to dissipate a little bit of power in this uh, chassis over here, and that power is going to eventually add up to, to some amount, and heat is going to come out. Remember, if these things get hot, the resistance changes. So the accuracy of this instrument is going to depend on the temperature of these resistors, and these are metal resistors, so they're not going to be very good. These are just wire resistors, essentially. Well, what better way to test this instrument than using the equipment that I repaired in the last video, this GW Instec kilowatt power supply, which was a very cool repair, and definitely check it out. It's got different modules in parallel, very cool design in there. So we're going to use that in combination with the BK Precision 8601, and this is going to act as our DC load, and it's going to 
constantly sync a specific power so that when we change the voltage it's going to adjust the current automatically and always dissipate as much power as we tell it. So right now I have it set to 200 watts and everything's wired up. It looks a little messy but it's all connected. So obviously there is no voltage, the power supply is turned off and this is turned off so we are seeing no watts there. So I'm going to zoom in just between these two instruments because those are really the two that you want to look at at the same time. There we go. So I'm going to turn the power supply on and if you see when I turn the power supply on I have 59.988 volts uh, but because this is not active I'm not drawing any power and of course this guy is not showing anything. Now remember that that 60 volts is being applied to this instrument but the needle doesn't move and that's simply because well you have no current in order to create a magnetic field for the needle to move. There is magnetic field but only from the voltage. Now if I go ahead and enable this I have it set to 200 watts so we expect to see 200 watts. Let's go and try that out. There you go, 200 watts and check it out. It's really, really close to 200 and you can see we have 59.5 uh, 59 volts and the rest of that is because of the drop in this cable and we're dissipating 200 watts. By the way, I tested this uh, power supply that I repaired extensively and it seems to work quite nicely. So if you look over here, you can see indeed we have this uh, sitting at around 200 but the low range, uh, the high range actually works better. So if I go to the high range, you can see that it is much closer to 200. Remember, now you're reading the other uh, number over there. So, yeah, it seems to be extremely accurate on the high range, but a little bit off on the low range. So now if I change the voltage of the power supply, now if you look over here, if I change the voltage, and if I want to have a constant 200 watt, it's going to have to change the current. But this needle should not move because the product remains the same. So let's give that a try. I'm going to go down. Look at that. You see how the current goes up? There you go, we got 4 amps, but you can see the needle doesn't move and it's at exactly uh, to 400. Actually, you know what, that kind of makes sense because they have calibrated this from 350 watts upwards. Maybe that's why it's not as accurate for the lower uh, settings there. There you go, I can continue to lower the voltage and you can see it's going to draw more and more current. And, oh, something happened. Oh, there it is. What happened was that, oh, that's interesting. So you can guess what I just did. This was set to draw only 5 amp maximum so I hit the constant current of this and this guy just collapsed the voltage down to 0.17 so I'm going to have to disable that that's going to go back up to 39 volts I'm going to increase the voltage we're going to enable this and there it is we're back to where we were so it works really nicely I'm quite happy with the performance of it and I hope that you enjoyed also the operation of this rather unusual watt meter I really like this vintage devices simply because somebody spent a lot of time figuring this out even though the technology may be obsolete the information and the knowledge that went into it is certainly still quite valid all right and the winner for the keysight dsox 1102g giveaway is a user by the name of sanity d1 so congratulations i'm going to send you a message and you have to let me know how i can get this unit to you and if you didn't win don't worry i'm giving away another one so please do the same thing leave a comment subscribe to the channel and you will be eligible to win another one of these. And remember that all my Patreon supporters, your chances of winning are essentially doubled or more because you're entered into the draw more than once. Once because you're a Patreon supporter and once because you're leaving a comment and you're a subscriber to the channel. So make sure you do those things to be eligible. But there's going to be another giveaway. I'm going to try and get this to Sanity D1 before Christmas if possible. If not, you'll have it uh, early next year, of course. And I'm going to give you guys another one or two weeks to leave comments so that you can win one more. And there's going to be even more giveaways so don't forget to subscribe and uh, listen to the channel and leave a comment and if you're a patreon supporter i really really appreciate it you make these things possible and i hope that you enjoyed this video and the experiments with it until next time